I have no idea. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, like, it's like gringo, you know what I mean? It's just like, whoo, Jesus, hallelujah. Good to be here again with you all. Love you guys. Thank you all for coming. And um, I want to talk to you today about positioning ourselves to participate in the present day visitation. And um, before I go into that, though, I just wanted to say this. Before you hear it in the news, coronavirus is not going away. Okay? It's a flu. Okay? Which means that like all flus, it has um, variants that we've now discovered. And they created a vaccine for a variant that doesn't work for the new variant. And that is not going to change. Okay? I believe that the Lord is pressing His church in this hour to stand on the truth of His Word that by Jesus' stripes we are healed. I said it from the beginning that this is the time that we must take hold of the Word of God like never before. There is so much deception that has filtered into the church you know, God's trying to teach you a lesson by getting you sick. God's sovereign. He might heal you. He might not heal you. Listen, the truth is, the man came to Jesus and he said, if you are willing, you will heal me. And Jesus said, I will. That settles it. He said, I will. Be healed. And we have to understand, we have gotten so filtered down <laughs> as the church from the days of power that God is bringing back in this hour. And it's time for us once again to be those who say no to the world and yes to God, that say no to the lies of the devil and say yes to the truth of God's Word, and that we will stand on it to the end. I got good news this morning for those of you that I told you, Apostle George Black, I'm associated with him. He's out of the hospital this morning. He's home after he was unable to breathe well yesterday, and he's doing a lot better. But uh, you think of him, Dr. Apostle Bishop George Black. <laughs> he's a good man, and I love him dearly, and I'm thankful he's home. So... Um, but the thing is, we have to understand, you know, John G. Lake, if you don't know him, look him up, Apostle to Africa in the early 1900s, coming out of the Azusa Revival. John G. Lake went to Africa to minister to the Africans in the midst of the bubonic plague, and he had hold of something. He had hold of Romans 8, chapter 2. Uh, <clears throat> says the spirit, uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. And he would minister to those people, and they would die of the bubonic plague, many, many, many people dying, and he didn't get sick. And the doctors came to him and the scientists and said, we want to know why you don't get sick. He said, well, when these people die, a froth comes out of their mouth that is filled with the bubonic plague, I tell you, take that bubonic plague and put it on my hand and put my hand under a microscope and you will see that it dies on my flesh. And they did that very thing and the, it died on his flesh because he knew that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made him free from the things that work in this world, which is the law of sin and death that he was a child of the kingdom and the word of God stood true for him to be able to believe it and live it and he walked in it and he, he actually ascended from a place of just divine healing to walking in a place of divine health where no disease, no virus, no bacteria, no germ could attach itself to his body. And I declare this and I pray it all the time. You guys know that my wife and my daughter had COVID back in October. So I recently went in for an antibody test. 
and it came back that I had no antibodies. I was taking care of them for 14 days. I thought surely I had it. I was standing against it every day. I was confessing the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Jesus Christ is my healer. By his stripes I'm healed. I don't receive this thing. I stood against it. There were several nights where I felt feverish and very weak. And I thought, well, is this thing trying to attach to my body? I rebuke it in Jesus' name. And the antibodies came back negative. And if this report is accurate, it said I'd never been exposed to COVID-19. I'm just saying that if we stand on the Word of God, and I am saying that in this hour we must stand on the Word of God and be those who believe, and God's power and glory will rest on us. Amen. Now to the message. (laughs) That was free. You can pay for the rest. (laughs) Isaiah 55 and verse 6 through 8. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Is there times when the Lord may not be found? It's an interesting word. Is there times when he is not near? What is he talking about? Let the wicked forsake his way. When? When God can be found. When God is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for our God will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways. Listen, we quote that last part very often, but he's referring to his ability to forgive and his ability of mercy that works in him towards the sinner. And and I will confess before you that I'm a sinner. And I hope that you can say the same about yourself. Yes, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but we're still sinners. Paul said it. Paul called himself a sinner. Why do we think that there's something wrong with that? We are sinners, but we're saved. Will I sin today? Probably. Will I sin tomorrow? Probably. But I believe that we are coming to a day that if we allow the fire of God to burn in us hotter that he is preparing a church that will be, at his return, holy and pure, without spot and blameless. Because we are going to allow that holiness that he's placed within us to completely take us over as we rid ourselves of self. You know, me and Mike were talking yesterday about that, you know. There's more, more of me, more of myself that I need to get rid of. And I hope you all are honest with God to say the same thing. So he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. In the Hebrew, and in some of the commentaries that I read, they said, in the day of his grace, which may not always be there. Now, we know God's grace does extend, but what I'm trying to explain to you to get you to understand that there are times When God is pouring out, there are times when God is moving upon the face of the earth. There are times when He is nearer than other times. They they said it could have meant uh, that it was while the temple stands because the presence of God was in the temple. And it was going to be destroyed at some point to where they would not be able to have that place, the Holy of Holies, where they had the Ark of the Covenant, where the Shekinah glory of God was, and and so that they wouldn't be able to even go to the temple to where His presence was. Because remember, they're not born-again people. They don't have the presence of God residing within them. And so He could have been referring to that. It says, while the temple stands, while there is a place to experience His Shekinah glory, before He hides His face and causes his Shekinah to remove from you. 
And I, I'm saying some things because, you know, I think a lot of times that Christians are a lot like Jehovah's Witnesses. You talk to a Jehovah's Witness, and they only know certain things, certain scriptures, and they only understand things by what they're taught over and over again. You try to bring them around to something else, or you try to show them something in the Greek or something, they, they can't, they, they, they don't want to go there. They'll, they'll skip on going back to what they know. They won't even address it, you know, because they, they don't know. And Christians oftentimes, I find, are like that. That's why I have to say, you know, I know we're the righteousness of God, but I'm a sinner too. I'm not contradicting the truth of God's word, but it's foolish for me to say I'm not a sinner. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I'm sinning. Hello. Okay? It's quiet in here. <laughs> That's some of that faith teaching that we've all heard. I'm spitting. Some of that faith, word of faith teaching that we've all heard, maybe some of us. I grew up on it. That's how I got saved, faith church. All right. Now, God had, um, I had uh, uh, released a word a couple weeks ago at my home church in Tennessee that, that we, this is the dawning of a new day. I really believe that God is doing something in the earth that we haven't seen before. I've been saying that for a couple years now as God has shown me that I believe that we're in the midst of a, a, a reverberation of the sound of Pentecost to where God is getting ready to pour out another Azusa Street, another charismatic renewal on us, the people of God. And I'm starting to contend for it, and it's consuming me more and more. I'm believing for revival. Revival is not a three-day camp meeting that we said is a revival. It's not a tent meeting. Revival is not evangeliz evangelization. Revival is waking up a church that is dead, that is religious, that is asleep. That is revival. And there will be no great awakening. There will be no huge evangelistic move until the church is awake and alive. You are the ones that God is calling to be the ones who will awaken and arise and allow yourselves to be on fire for God. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you that in this hour, God is revealing truths to His apostles, His true apostles and prophets, because you know there's false apostles and prophets. His true apostles and prophets, because it's the foundational work of the apostles and prophets in the church that is of the foundation, and he is revealing in this hour truths to his true apostles and prophets to uh, equip the saints for this hour, to be able to function, to be able to participate in what God is doing upon the face of the earth. I tell you, God is near now. God has once again come down, and God is close to the earth again. You're wondering what I'm talking about. I know. Look at this. Luke 19, 42 through 44. It's so saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. You're blind. For days will come upon you and your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So the Pharisees, as Jesus was speaking to them, told them because they did, not they did not understand, did not know the time of their visitation that calamity was going to come upon them. Ah. Thank you, Jesus. And I heard the Lord ask, I posted this. You guys can always follow me on Facebook. I post a lot of things. A lot of little things that are just nice. You can just grab them boom, and take that. Meditate on it. He had me say, are we administering the last move of God 
Or are we being a catalyst and reformer for the new move of God? Are we administrating the last move of God? Or are we being a catalyst and reformer for the new move of God? See, the Pharisees were administrating the last move of God for thousands of years. Administrating the last move of God for 400 years to this point. 400 years to this point, no prophetic words. It was completely dark. There were no prophets in Israel because all they were doing is the same things over and over and over again. And the church is doing the same thing. We're in a darkness where we're doing the same things over and over again. Time is passing. Our lives are getting shorter. The moment for our generation is ending. It's either now or it will pass on to the next. Listen, God has no requirement. We are not entitled in any way for God to move in our generation. But and if the time is now that he wants to move, we could possibly, if we don't allow God to revive our hearts, we could be on the outside looking in and not being, part not being participants in the move of God of the hour. I know this is intense. But he's being intense with me. I have on my heart so strong, I know Mike does too, for a revival in the church. It starts with us. It starts with us who attend church. It starts with us who think that we're, we're Christians and we're going, moving on with God. And we have to understand, are we just administrating the last move of God? The last great move of God on the earth was the charismatic renewal of the 60s and 70s. That's what I got saved in. 1979, at the end of the charismatic renewal, I got saved just before uh, my 19th birthday, April 12th, 1979, probably about 9 o'clock p.m. You don't forget the day you got born again if you really got born again. I'm telling you what, something happened to me and I changed from this angry little burnout, drug Addicted, thieving, robbing, fighting kid. And Jesus saved me and he changed me. I believe salvation is radical. I don't believe it's anything but radical. I mean, I think people that go to church and never had a radical experience are in danger of hell. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know what happened. How did you not have something drastic happen in your life? I mean, I'm talking you were dead spiritually, and the Spirit of God came into you and recreated you, the Spirit being, and made you alive, filled you with the life of God. How could that not radically transform you in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye? It does, right? If it doesn't, I don't know what happened. Maybe you need to get on your face and go to God again. I mean, it's something radical should be happening to you. You're change, everything should be changing about you. Yeah, you don't immediately transform, but your spirit sure did, and it just starts to affect your soul. And it can affect your body immediately. Jesus called those that were administrating the, that move of God blind. He called them blind guides. See, because when Jesus came on the earth, John chapter 1, you can read it later, it says that in him was life, and the life was the light of man. It goes on further, he says that he is the light that lights every man, that includes women, <laughs> that comes into the world. Right? You know that verse? Okay. He's the light. And so here they were, they were, he was calling them, you're blind, and I'm the light. This is what you need to transform you, to change you, 
And I don't mean just to be born again, but to change us, to open our eyes to see. I taught this message, well, somewhat some of this message last week, and I titled the message, Can You See What I See? Because I'm trying to convey to you what I see. And the light is the only thing that can illuminate you to see. And Jesus is the light. He came to reveal, to open up, to express God, to express the kingdom, to release it in the earth. <clears throat> and the Bible says that those, he sa it says he came and they didn't know him as the life and the light. It says he came to his own and they didn't receive him. And then he says, but to whomever receives him, he gives the right to become children of God. That's what the power of he who is the life and the light is. He makes us to be children of God. All of us who are Christians, we know that even though the world says, oh, we're all children of God, that's a lie. Only those who have received Jesus are those who are children of God. And there's something there about a, a principle of reception and revealing. Until you receive, the light can't be revealed. Now that's my introduction. Because I want you to understand something. I want you to be receptive right now and let go of the resistance that's in you. Because that resistance that's in you is the same thing that was working in the Pharisees. It's the same blindness that we cling to that holds us back from fully being receptive to the light so that things can be revealed to us that we don't know. And I'm telling you, every one of us don't know things. But God wants to reveal them. And if we just be receptive to Him, and humble ourselves to him who, whose thoughts are greater than our thoughts, we can let him reveal. Luke eleven thirty three. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar, nor under a basket, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. The eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. As I was preparing this message, the Lord gave me that. He said, eye clear. I wrote it down, put a question mark there. Because <laughs> I was like, what are you trying to tell me? And then I found this. I'm reading out of the New American Standard. That In the New American Standard, it says, when your eye is clear, your whole body, whole, notice the word whole, your whole body also is full of light. That word clear uh, in the Greek means single or focused. When your eye, I'm not talking about your physical eye here. This is a spiritual eye he's talking about, Jesus is speaking about. When your spiritual eye is single, when your spiritual eye is focused, then your spiritual eye is clear. And when your spiritual eye is clear, you can be illuminated by the revelation that God wants to bring into your life. Every bit of our life that is not focused allows darkness to enter in. Look, he says, but when it is bad, not single focused. Now you can look it up, it means evil, but I believe in context, this is what he's saying. But when it is bad, when it is not on the focus, singly, your body also gets full of darkness. Then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light, and how does your whole body get full of light? When your eye is single and focused, then your whole body is full of light. So if therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. Now, I love this out of the Passion Translation. Just listen. 
He says, the eyes of your spirit allow revelation light to enter into your being. That's, that's the revealing. When your heart is open, the light floods in. There it is. The receptivity, the principle of receptivity to revelation. When your heart is open, it is receptive, the light floods in. But when your heart is hard and closed, the light cannot penetrate and darkness takes its place because your eye's not clear. Open your heart and consider my words, he pleads. If your spirit burns with light, fully illuminated with no trace of darkness, you will be a shining lamp reflecting rays of truth by the way that you live. Wow. We're talking about, we're talking about participating in the present day visitation, which is revival. I mean, the prophets have been speaking it. You know, they're saying revival's here. I I don't know that it's like, I mean, I believe it's here, but I mean, it's like not in manifestation. Because revival's in here. Point to your heart. It's in here. This is revival. If it's not here, then you're not experiencing it, you know? We get excited about things. Woohoo! Revival. You know? But God's not doing anything in here. He's not doing anything in here. There's something wrong. There's no revival. That's not revival. Hallelujah. And um, thank you, Jesus. You guys indulge an old man today. <laughs> How are we doing? Oh, it's only 12 o'clock. We can go at least another hour. <laughs> what time did I get up here? I have no idea. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I had a dream where I was preaching for two hours. <laughs> I did. I'm not lying. I had a dream. I'm not saying it was here. because It was outside, but that don't mean nothing. Dreams are allegorical. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to read this to you. Uh, I woke up on January 18th, 2018. This never happened to me before. It's never happened since. I don't remember what I was dreaming. But I woke up, and the Lord said, write this down. So this is the Spirit of God. I'm going to read to you what the Spirit of God gave me on that morning, what I wrote down. I wrote it down in like three, four, five minutes. Imagine a church where every member came rejoicing that it was time to gather again as a body anytime the door was open, regardless of persecution and with no excuses. Where believers were interested in, weren't, weren't interested in programs, children's ministry, youth, singles, divorce, etc., and didn't need to be hand-fed and have their diapers changed. They didn't judge the leaders, and they weren't easily offended. Where they studied the word of God on their own and prayed on their own, not to be some scholar, but because it is essential to being who they really are, to their gifts manifesting, and to them fulfilling their God-given destiny. Where holiness is essential to a life lived in the presence of God, to possessing the anointing, and to manifesting the glory of God. And they make this church a place where love overcomes sin, where the weak are supported by the strong, where everyone is a leader and influences those around them, where they realize church is vital to their existence, and when they're together, they become a temple of the Lord, and a dwelling place of the Spirit, so they each come ready to release that which God has given them for the gathering. Where the fivefold office is in manifestation and working together, not to rule but to lead, a church as one organism, one body, one heart, one mind, one accord, same vision, same goal, expanding the kingdom, lifting up Jesus, seeing souls saved, and glorifying God in the earth. 
to this church, nothing would be impossible. This is the glorious remnant bride. This is a picture of revival. This is pi a picture of a revived church right there. This is a picture of the church in the book of Acts. I'll tell you that right now. I know that's what was going on because he revealed that to me. I know that that was what was happening in the book of Acts, that that's how they were. How else can you sell your properties and lay all the money down at the apostles' feet? How else can you be glad to all, it says they all came together and they broke bread together and they were rejoicing in the apostles' doctrine and they were expanding exponentially and they were right there. It says they were all with one accord. Come on. Peter and John get released from jail and come to them and tell them, Acts chapter 4, that they are not supposed to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And it says, with one accord, they began to pray. It didn't say, and then the apostles called a prayer meeting, and they went to the houses and gathered everyone and brought them together. No, everybody was already there. Everyone was there. And they were all prompted by the Spirit in the same moment to begin to pray. And it says that after the prayer in English, well, in Hebrew, came forth, that the place where they were was shaken. It was like a mighty earthquake, and they were all filled again with the Holy Spirit. And with great power, the apostles gave witness. Yes. And that's what we're after. Are we not? Do we not want that? Do we not want what I just read? Aren't we tired of just all the stuff that goes on? You know, we have to make the decision that we are going to be the reformers. We're going to be the ones that will be the catalysts for change. You know, ah. Bible says, New, New American Standard, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. I like that translation. Whose heart is completely his. What we're talking about here, people, is a heart issue. Will we allow our hearts to be completely his? You know, Jesus said the heart, what does he say? The heart is wicked above all things. But if we surrender our heart to God, our hearts can become pure and our hearts can be focused singly upon him and then his light can consume us and fill us completely. Listen, the light of God is the light that illumines heaven. That is what is in God, the life of God, which is the fire of God. For our God is a consuming fire. He wants to be within us to consume us with fire. He's placed his life in us. He's already set inside of each and every one of us that firing embers at the minimum no matter what level of revival you think is burning in your heart right now, I tell you, there is a fire inside of you. It is the life of God. It is the light of God. It is the fire of God. And it is in you. Already, we have to stoke it. Like the dream that I shared last night. You know, the, the turbo stove of the holy that was built with holy metal. It's that holiness as we surrender. The only way we're ever going to walk in holiness is in complete surrender. He's looking. His eyes are moving to and fro throughout the earth for those whose heart is completely his. Why? Because he wants to set us more further ablaze. As he wants, our, as we're singly focused and after him, he wants to fill us with that light and fire. Four things I want to talk about. Hopefully I can get through these quickly. This is what's required to get there. 
The first one is Philippians 3, 12 through 16. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, Paul says, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Listen, Paul wrote this when he was in prison. Paul wrote this when he'd already done his missionary journeys. Paul wrote this when he'd already been left naked, when he'd already been left in fasting, when he'd already been beaten with rods, when he'd already been stoned to death, when he'd already been whipped, when he'd already been uh, you know, forsaken, when he'd already had perils of his own countrymen, when he already had all those things. He wrote this after already. He'd already evangelized the known Western world. He'd already set up churches. He'd already raised up leaders in those churches. He'd already instructed them. He'd already spent years teaching. He'd already seen mighty miracles of God working. He'd already seen you know, people healed and delivered and redeemed and set free. He'd seen all these different things happen. You know, he'd cast devils out of diviners and, and, and sorcerers and all the things that he did in his life. And then he wrote, not that I have already attained, or am already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. He's saying, I haven't been able to grasp this whole thing yet. I, 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 I'm trying to lay hold of Jesus. He he laid hold of me at some point. He intersected my life and I was radically transformed and I have been after to grab hold of the completeness of him even up to this moment. He says, but one thing I will do, I will forget. Here's number one. I will forget those things which are behind. I'm going to forget last year. I'm going to forget my life before I was saved. I'm going to forget all the glory of those days of ministry. I'm going to forget all the persecution of those years of ministry. I'm going to forget tomorrow. I'm going to forget even this morning. I'm going to forget whatever just happened before I started to write this letter. I forget those things which are behind. And I reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now we often stop there, but I'm not stopping. He said, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, any of you who are here who've been in the Lord a long time and might feel yourself to mature, he's talking to you, talking to me. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Let us not let go of that which we've already attained, but let us continue to press on. Let us have this same mind that we're going to forget those things which are behind and we're going to press forward. We must do this every day. I say this is the apostolic anointing. To, have, to walk in the apostolic anointing that is released in this present hour, we must forget those things which are behind. We must have the heart of the apostle. That this is what we're after. Look at that. Even if you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you. See, that's the blind spots that we have on us. And that's number two. We have to recognize the blindness. We have to admit the blindness. We have to quit being in denial about blindness. Blindness is good if we embrace it that we might see. Okay? It's not a bad thing to be blind if we can embrace the light that we might see. John 9, 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and that those who do see may be blind. Now, let me read this again. For judgment I have come into this world that those who are reformers may see and those who are administrators may be blind. 
That's what he's saying. He's talking about that whole thing that I said. You know, are we, main, are we administrating the last move of God or are we reformers and catalysts for the new move of God? That those that are reformers will admit that they don't see so that they can see. Those who are administrators think they already see. So they're really blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with them heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? <laughs> Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Do you not see that if we say we see, that's sin? That's what Jesus just said. And who says that they see? When do we say that we see? I'll tell you right now what it is. It's when we give to a religious spirit. The Pharisees are the uh, explanation and the, the, uh, uh, the picture for us in the world of how a religious spirit works in a person. How many of you came out of any religion before you got saved? I mean, any denomination... Any religion, Buddhism, I don't care what it is, Zaoism, I don't care, Confucianism, I don't care what it is, Hinduism. Raise your hand. How many? Came out of something. You, 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 you had some experience with some religion. Most of us. I'll tell you right now, every one of you got religion in you. Every one of you have religion in you. Because when we've been indoctrinated in something else to whatever level that is not of the Spirit of God, that is a form and a tradition like the Pharisees, like Judaism was at the time of Christ's coming, it is nothing but religion. And what it does is it instills things in us. Many of us don't realize what we do. Mike, the very thing that you're talking about, about obligation, is a very uh, certain denomination that I came out of. It's a very, very much a thing because they teach that works is, is going to help you to your salvation. And see, if we allow things like that to work, I mean, I found that working in me so strong with God that I was actually like doing things to appease him because that is how I grew up. That you go do this thing and see, and then when you would do this thing that was required of you to do, then you felt good because you met your obligation. But it was no different than the Israelites, you know, every year, sacrificing a lamb for their sins to push them off for another year until the Savior would come. That's what obligation does. It doesn't really satisfy the spirit man. It doesn't re it's not a real heart connection when we only do things in our Christianity because we think that we're supposed to do them and we don't do them from the heart. That's just one example of how religion can work in us that is not of the Spirit of God. Now listen to this. John 9, still in there, but we're going to go to verse 1. It says, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And now we get the stup most stupid question in the whole Bible that comes forth here. He says, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Do you seriously think that an infant could sin in the womb so that he's born blind? Is that not like the dumbest question you've ever seen in the Bible? Jesus must have been, if he could do an emoji, you know. He had the shaking my head emoji. He was, eh, brother. <laughs> Three times, five times, exclamation point. <laughs> Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, did he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. Hey, what is he saying? There is a moment right now where God is nearer and there's going to be a moment coming forward very soon where God is not going to be so near. So I must do the works of God now 
And the purpose this guy is born blind is so that when I do the works of God, the glory of God is going to be manifest and the kingdom of God is going to be revealed in the earth. And it says, and so, um, he says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. I was telling Mike the other day, you know, this passage, uh, I heard from someone who had been a, a, a Jewish, uh, he was a Messianic Jew. And he said that the rabbis believed that the Messiah would even have healing anointing in his saliva. So, see, Jesus doesn't do things. We think, a lot of times we read these things and we think, Jesus is doing this because the Spirit of God is leading him, and it's just so crazy, but wow, okay, it happened. You know, it worked. No, he's doing these things oftentimes to testify of who he is. When he raised Lazarus on the fourth day, it was because the rabbis also believed that no spirit could come back into a body after three days. That's why he waited. That's why he didn't go. Yeah, your, your good friend Lazarus is dead. Okay, you know, and he didn't go. That's why he didn't go. He wasn't callous. He wasn't, you know, un, un, you know unhurt by the fact that Lazarus had died. And so in this moment, he's, he's revealing, I'm the Messiah. It says, he spat on the ground, made clear with his saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is, which is translated sent. So he went, where? To where he was sent, and he washed, and he came back seeing. That word sent there in the Greek is the word apostello. God spoke to me. He said, in this hour, he is calling his church. He wants us, as he says in Revelation 3, that we would anoint our eyes with eye salve that we might see. He said to me that he, Jesus is directing his people in this hour, that if we will respond to his direction, that we who have been blind, Possibly even from the moment of our spiritual birth, where religion was so inwrought already in our lives, and that is what makes us blind, that he says, in this hour, if we will respond to the direction of Jesus, that there is an apostolic pool of washing, that if we go to that pool and allow ourselves to be washed after having anointed our eyes with eye salve, we will see. I know that's out there. What that means is just what I'm saying. Listen, he said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. This is to the Laodicean church. This is the church of our hour. The lukewarm church is us. When we look at, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, the, there's two thoughts in that and I believe they're both right. With the seven churches in, in um, Revelations, I believe all seven churches happen at the same time because there are some believers in the church who are dead. There's some believers in the church who are lukewarm. There's some believers in the church who are being persecuted. You know, there's some believers in the church who are, are, are loveless. These are the churches. I'm reading to you the, the seven churches in Revelation. But I also believe there's a truth to eras of the church. And we see that through time and in the sequence of the seven churches as Jesus released those prophetic words. And the last church is the lukewarm church. I believe this is the hour of the lukewarm church. That for the most part, the church is, is asleep, but there is a remnant who is rising up, who is allowing themselves to become the living church, the alive church. They will also probably be the persecuted church. But this is the church that's going to separate, that's going to be the wheat, you know, separating from the chaff. Come on. We decide in our hearts. Will we put the eye salve on our eyes? Will we say, yes, I'm blind. I need to see. Jesus, open my eyes that I may see. Lord, I submit myself to be singly focused. Lord, help me to rid the things from my life that, that allow me to be double-minded 
and to allow my heart to go astray. I want my heart to be focused solely on you, Lord God, because when my heart is focused solely on you, not only am I being receptive to allow your light to come in, but my whole body is going to be filled with light. The third thing is returning to our first love, Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. I want you to listen to these accolades that Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, which is the loveless church. He said, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. Those are good things. I just want you to think, I mean, if, if there was a church that you heard this about, wouldn't you, I, I think you might like to go to this church. Listen, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. I mean, these, are, these guys are in pursuit of holiness. They, do, they won't allow evil. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles. So they embrace the fivefold office. They allow it in, and they, it says, and uh, you, you put them to the test, and they are not. You found them to be false. And you have perseverance. You've endured for my name's sake. So they have suffered, you know, some things that, uh, that they've had to fight through and hang on to and, and not doubt God, but stand on his word and, and, and get the victory. Uh, and they've not grown weary in doing that, he says. But I have this against you, that in all these good things that you have, you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. That is some hard prophetic word right there. He is saying that the very illumination and light that they have, even that he will take away if they don't return to their first love. And he says, remember how far you've fallen, repent, and do the deeds that you did at first. What did you do? I want you to think back. What did you do? When you first got born again, what was that like when you realized that you had been transformed, that Jesus came into your life and changed you? I remember, man, I remember that uh, I was thinking about this and I thought, man, I remember I got saved on that Thursday, April 12th, uh, 1979. Easter was that Sunday and um, I, I, I couldn't go to church. I had gone to church four times on the fourth time that I'd gone to this church is when I got saved. Uh, they used to have a Thursday night service. And on Sunday, I couldn't go. I'd gotten sick, and uh, I was really sick. And so I just, I just stayed at home, and, and uh, my, my family left. They went to Catholic church. And, um, and so I was there, and uh, I was all by myself, and I was sick. And I, I just took out my Bible. And I, I was, I'm talking three days old in the Lord, you know? And I was just loving God, and... Um, and um, uh, they had prayed for me to receive the Holy Spirit, but I didn't get anything at the moment, you know, but I was, I was believing it, and I was just, I was, hey, man, whatever, God, you got, I'm open, and, and I read the whole book of John, just me and Jesus, me and Holy Spirit, and he's just pouring out his love on me and just revealing himself to me, and, uh, and, and, and I've told you guys before, you know, I would just, I'd go up to people, I'd just tell them, you know, I'd be like, you know, you, you know the Bible says, Ye, I was listening because I had the King James Version, you remember? King James Version. And I would say to him, ye must be born again. The Bible says ye must be born again. I was telling everybody, you know, and they'd be like, well, what does that mean? I don't know, man. All I know is man. I said man a lot back then, you know. I was a stoner, okay. I'm like, man, I don't know, man, but, you know, I mean, Jesus came into my life. I'm telling you, I'm different. Something happened. I'm transformed. I've changed. You know, I don't feel like getting high anymore. I don't want to do that stuff anymore. I mean, just radical change. But it was all about what? It was all about him. It was all about my relationship with him. It was all about growing in him. I just couldn't absorb enough of whatever was about him. That's what he's talking about. Do those first works. Get back to that love. Get back to that. I love the word of God. I love talking to you, Father God. I love Holy Spirit. Get back to that, man. Let that stuff get burning back in your heart again. Get back to that. I've told you guys before, I mean, there's something about saying, 
you know, in the morning, oh, I love you, Father. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for being in my life and just begin to love on him. I'm telling you, there's something about doing that every day. Just saying it with your mouth, just confessing it, acknowledging his existence. Thank you, I'm alive today. Thank you, I've got breath. Thank you, I've awakened to a new day. Thank you, thank you that that means I got purpose today, Lord. You know, we just begin to just walk with him and just talk with him. There's power in that. There's power in loving on him. And, and, and just be honest, Lord, I want to love you more. I don't love you enough, God. You've loved me so much. You know, there's something about, uh, uh, there's a prophetic word I released in May. There's something about this um, love of the Father and us grasping his love that allows us to be able to love him back. So there's like a, it's like a cycle. The more that we experience his love, the more we love him back. And, and then as we are filled with his love and we release his love, then it says that our, our hearts are, are filled with the love of God. Uh, what is that verse? Uh, Romans, uh, help me, Jesus. Romans 8, 5. Uh, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is within us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. You know how that gets shed abroad? Every time we release it, you know, we, we experience his love. We love him back. We love the world. When we release the love to the world, you give love, what do you get? What do you get? Love, right? What you sow, you reap. You give love, you get love. It's, that's another never-ending cycle. You can't eliminate it. You give life, you get someone born again. There is nothing. I tell you, there is nothing in the world that is more exciting to help someone receive the invitation to Jesus and you experience life because they received life. I'm telling you, there is nothing like it. If you have never really brought someone to the Lord, you don't know what you're missing, man. You give life, you get life. Oh, that's an awesome thing. You don't know what happens in your spirit, man. But something happens. It is powerful. It's the sowing, the, the cycle of sowing and reaping. Lastly, so the question becomes then, when we're looking at this scripture of will we allow our hearts, you know, to return to the love of God again? Is it raining? No, okay. Rain down all upon the earth. Thank you, Jesus. That we want his love. Hope you're, none of your windows are down. Oh, thank you, Lord. You know, he's saying return to that, our first love. I'm telling you, that is the surrender of the heart. Forget, you know, acknowledge our blindness. Let's return our hearts to him. Let him touch our hearts. Let him break our hearts. Weep before the Lord. You know, real men cry before God, okay? Uh. Let him touch your heart. Let him touch your heart with the things that touch his heart. Oh, I tell you, you don't know what it's like if you haven't let him break your heart for things that break his heart. I, I can't even explain it. Whew. But you'll get wrecked. Right, John? <laughs> You're going to get wrecked. Hallelujah. Last one. So if we're willing to go that far, then I'm going to tell you what, what's necessary to get the all of it is to wrestle. To wrestle. To wrestle. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. This is my last verse. Some of you are saying, thank God. Genesis 32. <laughs> Verse 24 through 30. Again, I'm reading out of the New American Standard. Kind of liking that Bible, horse. I know you like New American Standard. <laughs> then Jacob was left alone, 32, 24, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. This is the only time that this word is used in the Hebrew. Listen, when you study the Hebrew and Greek, and every one of you should be studying the Hebrew and Greek, 
Listen, come on, we're in the 21st century. On your phone, people. Get the Accordance app. Accordance, A-C-C-O-R-D-A-N-C-E. Accordance app. You touch the word, bing, pop up, Hebrew or Greek, definition. Anybody, if I can do it, you can do it. It's the only time it's used. Anytime I see a word that it's the only use in the entire Bible, it tells me there's something extremely spiritually significant about what I'm about to read. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Who knows who the man was? Jesus. He wrestled with Jesus. It says, when, when he, Jesus, saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, Jesus said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. See, Jacob knew he was not wrestling with a man, even though he maybe had been in a man form. Jacob knew there was something here. This was someone who was at a higher level than him, someone who could bless him. And so he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, Jesus said to him, what is your name? You think Jesus doesn't know his name? He says, and he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you asked my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, He knew the name. I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. That word in the Hebrew preserved means to be saved, to be delivered, to be spared. Listen, Jacob wrestled with God. Wrestling in this passage has a, a, is derived from a word that speaks of dust. Now, some think that wrestling maybe because uh, in that day, you know, like in the, in the Greek Empire, Roman empires, you know, they had the wrestlers and the wrestlers you know, would wrestle, and the ground was full of dirt, and so while they were wrestling, you know, dust would get stirred up. Some of them, the Romans actually, would put dust on their bodies because of the sweat. They didn't want it to, uh, you know, to make it so they couldn't grip one another. But I believe spiritually that dust refers to us in our fallen nature. Dust is what we're from. God made man of the dust of the earth. We are dust. And it, what happened here is, and what happens to us in the wrestling in our prayer time with God is that we realize our dust, we realize our nature, and we realize that there is absolutely nothing that we can do for God and accomplish in the kingdom unless this dust is divinely breathed upon and inspired. It's impossible. And that only comes when we're wrestling with God and we recognize what we are. And so prayer is wrestling with God. And Jacob was wrestling with God. He was wrestling with his flesh. Jacob was at a place in his life where he had um, fulfilled his namesake, truly. And he was at a point where he was about to meet Esau, who he hadn't seen for 20 years. And Esau was coming with 400 soldiers. 400 men. And Jacob was freaking out. And Jacob had split up his group and everything, and, you know, hidden his wives away and his kids and all this stuff and split them all up. And, and, and he went. I believe he was alone because Jacob went to pray. This wrestling occurred in a moment of seeking God. He knew that he felt his life was in peril and he felt maybe his own lineage was in peril. Listen, he had stolen the birthright of his brother. And his brother was coming into his life. His brother, if he killed him, would take the birthright back, right? And the blessing that goes with the birthright. 
So here he is, he's fighting with, he's wrestling. What he doesn't understand is that everything in his life has brought him to this point. And so he's wrestling with God, with everything in him. What he's really fighting is that fleshly nature and that dust. He's fighting it with everything in him. Everything that he's done to this point, you know, and, he, and he's hanging on. He wants the blessing. He won't let go. Jesus recognizes it. He touches his hip. He injures his hip to, 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 to hobble him, you know, so that he can win. And he still won't let go of him, even though now Jacob's losing. He's not going to let go. And he says, I won't let go until you bless me. This is the prayer of the hour that we need to have to wrestle with God. God, I'm not going to let go till I get that which I'm after. Father, I'm after revival. God, I'm after revival in my heart. God, I'm after getting rid of the dust. Lord, I want you to breathe upon me and animate this flesh, God, and remove all of the myself that needs to go, Lord, that I might be consumed with you. This is the fight that he was having. And, uh, and he says to him, what's... What's your name? That's why I said to you, do you think Jesus didn't know his name? Jesus knew his name. He wanted Jacob to acknowledge who he was. That's the wrestle that we must have. We must come to that place where we're going to wrestle with God to the point of who we really are and what we've really done to this moment and all the things that we've allowed to, to stay that need to go if we're really going to be on fire for him. Jacob was a supplanter. That's what his name means, supplanter. That's what he did. He was a deceiver. That's what he was. And when he finally got to the place of saying, I am Jacob. I am a supplanter. I am deceiver. Then God said, Jesus said, no longer will you be called Jacob. I change your name to Israel. I change your name to be the one who fought with God and with men and overcame. He didn't beat Jesus in the wrestling match. He overcame his self. He overcame who he was. He overcame what he was doing. He dealt with all that he did with men before that point, how he had mistreated them, how he had hurt them, the things that he had done. That's what he was addressing. Those were the things. And I'm telling you in this hour, as he says, Jacob realizes in the end, he says, I've seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved or saved. I'm telling you, your life will be preserved your life will be saved. Your life will be delivered. Your life will be spared. That's what that word means in the Hebrew. Only if we will wrestle with him, we will only get to the place of really being able to fulfill what God has destined from the beginning if we will do these things and we will spend that time in prayer and wrestle with God. You can only do it by yourself. I'm telling you right now, you have to be alone. Jacob was alone. These are things you can't even, I mean, your spouse can't help you. I'm telling you right now, your pastor can't help you. You have to be the one who puts yourself in a position to where you're going to allow God to deal with the things in your life and you're going to lay them down and you're going to surrender and you're going to allow his fire to burn hotter. Only you can do that. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. You know, I've said many times in this church, that there's, there was five wise virgins and five foolish virgins. And I used to think that the five wise virgins were, virgins were so harsh in saying that they couldn't give them their oil. And then finally God revealed to me why. He, they, said, they said, you go get your own oil to the foolish virgins. And what they were saying is this, I can't give you what I had to sacrifice to obtain. You have to go. And you have to go through the paths that I went through to get this fire burning hot. I can't do that for you. You have to do it alone. You have to go to God. What? And it's interesting. It's something to buy because in Revelation 3, that's what he's saying to the lukewarm church. Buy for me. I counsel you. Buy for me, please. Buy for me. Gold tried in the fire. White raiment. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see. We've got to get to this point, people. Wrestling with God. Would you come to the front, please? I 
I just, I just feel, I just want to pray. I, I, just, I just want us just to pray. All of us just to pray. Ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. If you pray in tongues, I want you just to pray in tongues, just to begin to just release, just to allow God, just to let him work in you. What we're doing is we're coming before him. You know, it doesn't matter how hot the flame is in us, it can still burn hotter, okay? You know, we, 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 we want all of him. We are not of those who say we see. We are those who say we don't see, that we might see. So let us be honest with God in this moment. Let us be real before him. Let us be receptive. Allow him to bring the light and the revelation that he wants to bring into us. This is only a moment where we're going to commit ourselves to doing these things so that we might be revival people. And um, like I said, you've got to get into a place on your own to really be able to do this yourself, okay? Oh, God, we look to you, Father. God, we're believing you for fire from heaven, God. We're believing for tongues of fire again, Lord, to fill us, God. Father, to burn in our spirits, Lord. God, we accept, Father, this day, God, your call to us to come that you counsel us to buy from you gold tried in the fires of heaven, God. Lord, that we would also put on the white raiment, God, that you are offering us, Lord, that our nakedness would not be known, God. Father, that righteousness that comes only from you, Lord. And God, that we anoint our eyes this day, Lord, by saying we don't see. We acknowledge that we don't see, God, that we've got blinders in our eyes and that we need to see, God. We anoint our eyes now, Lord, with that anointed clay, Lord God, even as the man in John 9, eyes were anointed with that, with that saliva of Jesus that contained the ability to open eyes. Lord, open our eyes, we pray this morning that we might see. God, that we might see us, Lord, and that we would acknowledge who we are, God, before you. We quit being deceptive and covering up, Lord, when in your presence, God. You see everything, and you know everything. So let us be real with you this morning, God. Let us approach you with honesty, God, and humility, Lord, before you this day. Father, we say that we will do as you have asked us to do. Lord God, would you say this with me? Say, Father, I come to you. I repent of all the things that you're revealing to me, even in advance I repent of all the things you're going to reveal to me that I need to shed for my life, that I might have all of you. Lord, I understand that there was a great exchange done on the cross. You gave your life for me, Jesus. Now it's my turn. I give my life for you. You gave your life, Jesus, that you would have my life. All of my life. All of me, God. For all of you. That is the great exchange. I'm willing to give all of me for all of you. That's all I can offer. And I thank you that from this moment, as I forget the things of the past, as I acknowledge my blindness, As I return to my first love, Jesus, that when I go from this place and I wrestle with you, you're going to set me free. You're going to save this life, that this life would fulfill what you've destined it to be. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys know this chorus? Come and consume, God, all we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. Let's sing that. Come and consume, God, all we are. 
We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. Come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. Oh, we want you. Sing it in the first person. Come and consume God, all I am. I give you permission. My heart is yours. I want you. Oh, I want you. One more time. Come and consume God, all I am. I give you permission. My heart is yours. I want you. Oh, I want you. Lord. Thank you for letting me release that. Hallelujah. Thank you for being receptive. Lord, move on your hearts. I urge you to go and wrestle. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Mary, I just feel <clears throat> that, that you are just really breaking out into something newer than, and fresher than you've had before. I mean, the anointing upon you is only increasing. You know, as you've separated yourself unto God, be used by him. Your desire is to allow him to be that vessel that I just really sense that, that this stepping forward is now going to release greater than God has been. You're going to get revelation of the word never seen. It's going to be pouring in. And you're going to be releasing things body needs to hear from this power. Not just the teaching, but it's going to be a prophetic ability on you. Speak forth the very words of God and release the revelation in the moment for the, for the revived church, for the remnant. I just want to encourage you with that. Know that he's speaking to your life. Gentle thorn. I, I just feel we should just um, pray for Horse for a moment and Betty. You guys are holding him. Just the, the physical uh, needs that you guys have. And how God wants to move upon your hearts and just remove also any unbelief that could possibly be there. I'm telling you, there's something about this, this revival prayer that I've been doing uh, with the pastor at my home church in Tennessee. Um, uh, he was saying that the Lord revealed to him the passage of when the, um, when the uh, 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 disciples could not cast out the devil and they asked Jesus why we can't cast him out. And Jesus said, this kind not this kind of devil, this kind of unbelief, he was saying, does not come out except by prayer and fasting. And I just sense that the Lord, you know, I think with every one of us, so him and I, you know, in these prayer meetings, we've just started to ask the Lord, Lord, you know, show us, what are we, what, what are we lacking? Where, where do we have unbelief that you, you know, and you begin to realize the things that really you doubt. You know, you, you, you're real confident, you know, you're a man of God, you're a woman, woman of God, you've been saved a long time. You feel you, you know what he's directing you to do. Sometimes you're just on that mode and you're going and going and you're not realizing the things that are hindering you. And sometimes it's just this unbelief, you know. So I just, I just want to pray just for both of you that God would just not only, you know, heal you, but there's the, to just let go of every possibility of anything in your soul that would cause you to think that any of this stuff is allowed to linger for any reason. And so, Father, we just thank you now, God, just for that revealing and if, Lord, if the Lord puts upon you, you know, a time of fasting and prayer, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you only can do what you can do, you know, with whatever medication you're on or whatever. But, but God knows, and, you know, it can be just, um, just spending time in prayer with him and cutting off other things uh, and, and, just, and, and just that alone, uh, it, not necessarily the food fasting, just fasting away by separating unto him and allowing that time of prayer that, uh, that God is just going to bring some greater release and I believe greater release that, that occurs in that spirit and soul affects the body. You know, he says, uh, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So, Lord, I just pray now, God, the prospering of the souls, Lord, the mind, the will, and the emotions, God, even to a further level, God, just like Paul, we've not apprehended. 
We're after even greater, God. Even greater in you, Lord. God, we want you to consume not just our spirits, but our souls and our bodies. So now, Lord God, we just pray, Father, your anointing upon their bodies, God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. God, just encourage them, Father, with change now in the name of Jesus. We believe you. By Jesus' stripes, they're healed and made whole, Father. In the name of Jesus, Father, we believe, God, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made them free from the law of sin and death. Father, we declare that, that Jesus bore uh, all sickness, all pain, all disease, all, uh, 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 all things related to age. He bore in his body. Father, God, uh, uh, we just pray, Father, as Moses could see, as Caleb could conquer his mountain, that Father, in their... Uh, age, Lord God, that they would be above and beyond their years, Lord, in their physical ability, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, and that their heart's desires would be fulfilled, that they would walk out that which they still see, Lord God, Father, and not one thing would be held back from them. God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord.